Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing? Hey, I got a question. How many of you guys have already uh, put up most of your, or at least started your Christmas decorations? How, most of you guys done that? How many of you guys haven't even started yet? It's like December 8th, people. Come on. Let's get going. Hey, you know, this is, uh, for a lot of us, is the, 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 uh, the funnest time of the year, the most exciting time of the year, uh, with lights, uh, Christmas music on Z88 or 107, whatever you like to listen to, 24-7, you just, you know, as much as you, you possibly can get, uh, driving around, looking at the, the lights, um, you know, the parties, Christmas itself. This is, generally speaking, most people's uh, favorite time of the year, right? You know, you, you get to wear your ugly sweaters and have a, you know, a good time on purpose, right? And uh, it's just a fabulous time. But it's also, if truth be told, for some of us, it's also a, a very difficult time of year, right? It can be a very, you know, there's a, there's a dark side to Christmas as well. It can be a season for some of us that can create some anxiety, you know, maybe some stress over whether you're going to be able to provide the Christmas that you would love to, to provide for the people that you love. And you realize you only have a very small financial bandwidth this year. And so that kind of creates some anxiety. Uh, for some of you, maybe this time of year might be really especially difficult. Uh, maybe it brings about some, a sense of, of, of depression and sadness. Maybe you, you lost a loved one or somebody left you. And so this time of year just kind of uh, brings those, those heartaches and the, those pains in, into, the, into the forefront. And so Christmas has kind of lost its maybe childhood luster, if you will. Um, in fact, the New York Times recently did an article that shows that Christmas is getting darker for us. More and more of us are more isolated, more lonely, um, we're more depressed. In fact, one recent study said that, that um, our, our state of isolation or to be isolated is like as worse as like 15, smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And our loneliness epidemic is greater than our obesity epidemic, where 300 to 400,000 people die every year of obesity. So you can only imagine how much, um, you, know, uh, you know, pain and suffering that's going on in our lives through this depression and isolation. And so sometimes during Christmas, when it feels like it should be the time of year where you feel, should feel really connected and really happy, for some reason you feel really gray and feel really down and, and depressed or, or anxious. But let me say this to you, okay? Maybe, you know, you came in here, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. Oh, man, now he's talking about depressing things. Or maybe you came in here and you're going, man, that's, that's me. I, I'm, I'm dealing with that. And, um, and, and, and you feel something already deep inside of you and something that you really just don't really like to feel. But let me give you some good news, and this is this. Jesus Christ wasn't born in order to make you feel anxious or stressed. All right? And Jesus Christ wasn't born in order to make you sad and depressed. In fact, he came into this world to actually do the opposite of that, to give us peace and to, to turn our sadness into joy. The question is, is, is how does he do that? Because oftentimes in life, we can feel very stuck you can feel stuck feeling these anxious thoughts and feeling stuck and feeling these, these, this depressing kind of way and not really know how to get out of it. Maybe we try to do some self-help stuff to try to put a smile on our face and, you know, we're kind of grinning, but inside we're just feeling really, really bad. Or sometimes maybe we can memorize scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and you're just kind of gritting your teeth the whole time, but yet, yet you feel this, this sense of being stuck in that. Well, God's never meant for us to be stuck in that. Now, the feeling that you have of anxiety and, and stress and loneliness and depression is not uncommon. In fact, it is something that we have dealt with as human beings from the beginning of time. You know, even though we may feel this way, you're not alone in that. You can go back into many, many thousands of years ago, and you can see cultures and societies dealing with the same types of stress and anxieties that we feel, dealing with the same type of isolation and depression and things like that as well as we do today. Sometimes what we think is like we're the only people, right? 
I must be the only person who feels this way because when I look at Instagram and Facebook, everybody's having a blast except for me, right? You know, or, you know, you just walk around, you just look, and it looks like everybody has their life together except for me. And what we end up doing with that stuff is we begin to kind of shove that stuff inside of us. I don't, want to, I don't want to tell anybody that because, you know, I don't want to look like an idiot or I don't want to look like a weak person because I can't get my act together. Or I don't want to tell anybody because I don't want to be Debbie Downer and that sort of stuff. So we, we kind of shove that in. But I want you to know, in all reality, you're not alone. In fact, every single one of us in here, from time to time to different levels, deals with stress, anxiety, feeling alone, and feeling depressed. We can go back, like I said, all the way back into time. And you look at a group of people, the Israelites. And here is a group of people that God did many miraculous things, gave them a lot of incredible piece of property. And God gave them all of these incredible rules by which to live by in order to make them feel fulfilled and happy, by which they are to connect with God and connect with each other. God gave them all these incredible things. But over and over, you see all of these cycles throughout their history of finding themselves in a place of darkness and despair of, you know, and disconnect with God and disconnect with each other, with humanity. Over and over and over, we, we see that. If you were to read the Old Testament, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a good, gracious God that, that bails them out, gives them all these incredible rules to live by, provides graciously for them. And then all of a sudden what we see them is kind of disconnect from God and disconnect from one another. And then that despair and all of that junk begins to come into their culture. There was a time when they were particularly going through a really down time. And there was a prophet. There's a prophet named Isaiah that God sent to go and speak to the people. Going to speak into why they're feeling this way, what, what is happening, which is at the core of it. The core of the message is this disconnect from God by which he's creating this disconnect with humanity. And so, but through that dark period of time, he gives them some hope. And he says this in Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, okay, this is actually God speaking through Isaiah here. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. So the feeling that you're experiencing, Israel, it's not going to go on forever. For those of you who are dealing with darkness and despair, let me encourage you that the time of darkness and despair will not go on forever if you allow God to work in your life. Because then he goes on, he says this, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Now, first of all, what in the world does that mean? What he's saying here is that there's a group of people, much like you and I, dealing with darkness and despair. But he said, you know what? The people that live in that region, in that area, which if you were to look on a map, it would be around, if you saw a map of Israel, you would see the Dead Sea. There's a little uh, river that goes up called the Jordan River, and there's a little lake there called Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee has been made popular by one guy named Jesus Christ because that's where Jesus did most of his, his ministry there. And so what Isaiah is speaking into, that guys, you're feeling and experiencing this darkness, but there's a light that's going to come that's going to eradicate the despair and darkness that you're experiencing. And so he goes in verse 2, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And what is that light? Well, if you were to flip over to Matthew chapter 4, you would see that light is Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the one, when he came on the scene of Galilee, he was the light and the one who is to bring light to a dark world. Okay? There's a lot of the Israel story that we can empathize with. We, you know, sometimes you can feel a sense of anxiety and depression. and you go, well, wait a minute, I know what to do. Israel had all the tools in their toolbox. They got the law, they got God's promises, they had everything. But you see them going through this cycle over and over and over and over. And we can go into the same cycle as well. 
We can go, man, I, I know I just need to be happy. I know that my life is good. I know that I shouldn't be anxious. But why do I still feel this way? Why am I still dealing with all of these things? Okay, and so sometimes what we think is, is that we just need to go to a church service like this. And if the preacher man can give me five things to work on, then I can get myself out of that depression. Well, here's the deal. God gave Israel everything that they possibly need, all the rules and regulations by which to live their life, and they kept falling flat. And a lot of us, we've been given, maybe gone to church our whole lives, but yet we still deal with this stuff. Why is there a disconnect? Why is there a disconnect? Well, the first reason why there's a disconnect is because oftentimes we are trying to do life alone. That we, we deal with our struggles and our hurts alone. Just give me the rules, give me the principles, and I will go deal with it so that way I can slip out of this junk into something else by which nobody will know that I ever felt that way before. And it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. What begins to work is this, is that we begin to realize that we're not alone. You and I, we're not alone in this thing. In fact, the first thing I want you guys to realize is this. You are not alone in feeling alone. You're not alone in feeling alone. Everybody from time to time feels alone. Like I said earlier, there are times when we go think that everybody else's life must be great except for mine. It's a farce. It's not real. You know why? Because we're all just kind of going through life trying to make the appearance that, man, we're doing great. Everything's going fine. You know, and we don't want people to think that we can't, you know, handle our own stuff. So we just deal with it alone. Recent studies show that 71% of 13-year-olds to 35-year-olds feel alone once or twice every single week. 71%. And that number gets higher with the elderly. A lot of us feel alone. Now, we think that we're the only one who feels alone. But here's the deal. You're not alone in feeling alone. In fact, the more that we can really realize that and come to grips with that, we actually feel less alone. We're kind of in this together. And that's kind of how God begins to work in our lives. It's not so much about true statements and principles. It's about relationships. Now, true statements and principles play a part in that, but they're only meaningful in the relationships that we have, first and foremost, with God. And that's why God sent his son. God sent his son first and foremost to bridge that disconnect between our sin. You know what sin is? Sin is separation in relationship. It's a ding in a relationship. It basically says, God, I don't care. I'm going to go do my own thing. That's a separation in relationship. When I go and I hurt somebody, guess what happens? That's a separation in relationship. Jesus Christ came into this world to mend the broken relationship that we created because he understands that the biggest fulfillment in our life is that relationship with him. It's the one thing that gives us the greatest joy. We tend to think it's circumstances. We tend to think that it's other people and the way that they should treat us and all that sort of stuff. That doesn't really necessarily bring us about the greatest joy. The greatest joy is the intimacy of an authentic, open relationship with the God who created you and loves you. In fact, we see um, in Matthew chapter 1, you know, the angel Gabriel talks to Joseph about her, his, uh, you know, fiance getting pregnant, and, um, you know, a little flipped out when you find out your fiance is, is pregnant, but the angel Gabriel said, hey, chill out, it's okay, this is, this is from God. In fact, not only is this from God, Matthew goes on and says, this is to fulfill what was spoken of many, many years before Jesus to give Israel hope, humanity a hope. And now that hope has come, and his name is Jesus Christ. In fact, he goes on right here, Matthew 1, 23, and quoting back into Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God is with us. That's right. The hope is this, that God is with us. Not that, that God is come here in order to tell us all the things that we're not doing right, in order for us to get it, you know, to get it right, so we can go on and live happily ever after. If that was true, Jesus Christ would have, wouldn't have died. He just would have written a book, right? 
and by which then he would just give it to us and say, hey, go get your act together. But it, we don't do that because we think and we've thought that it's about my power, it's about me, it's about my work, when in all this whole time, it's really about the fulfillment of my life, it's really about a relationship with God. That God became flesh in order to relate to us. That's where we find the wholeness in, in our lives. Because here's the deal, what is darkness? You know what darkness ultimately is? Darkness is ultimately the retreating of a relationship with God and humanity. The darkness and depression that we feel in our lives is the, is the retreating inwardly into our lives. That's why we feel that way. The whole idea of dark and light, when you look at Scripture, is really in the idea of not just knowledge, but really, truly, more in the idea of relationship. That when I begin to come inward into myself, I become dark. I begin to separate myself from God, and I begin to separate from myself from other people. And that's why I begin to feel the way that I do. In fact, as Caleb said last week, talking about emotions, emotions are good. They are a gift from God. Even the bad emotions that we feel, you kind of may think, well, wait a minute, I don't really like feeling those bad emotions, so how can those emotions, those bad emotions, be a good thing for us? It's just like the way that your human body works, right? If you cut yourself, you feel it, right? There's a reason why you feel it, in order to help you to recognize there's something wrong, I need to do something about it, so that way there's healing involved in that. Anxiety and stress and depression and things like that, those are the things that God gives us by which hopefully we begin to realize there's something not right. There's something wrong, just like I've been cut. Uh, there's something not going right inside of us. And if we dig deep enough, what we'll find is that laceration is a relationship. It's a relationship with God or it's a relationship with somebody else that begins to, to draw us into a place um, of darkness. But Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, stepped into our darkness relationally. Jesus Christ didn't just come into this world as some kind of a little baby little fairy tale in order to make us go, oh, that's so cute. Now we can go live our lives and, you know, happy fuzzy and all that stuff. That does nothing for us. The only thing that really does anything for us is the fact that our God is with us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants a better relationship with him. Not in the better in the sense that we get our act together, but a, a better relationship by which we talk to him more. We do a lot more life with him. We trust him more. We go and, and just do everything with him and learn from him. Not just about him, but to do life with him. That is what, where we get our ultimate joy. And God knows that. That's why in his ultimate genius plan, it was to become human and to sacrifice his life for us, okay, to pay, yes, to pay the, the penalty for the injustice that we have caused against God and all of our self-centeredness and all of our darkness as we retreat from God and from others. But he also stepped into that in order to bring us back into that relational light by which we see God and go, yes, I no longer feel dark. I feel whole again because I know that I am loved. And here's the point here, guys. Is this. The light you need is not something you need to know, okay? When we tend to think of light, enlightenment, right? Back in the 1800s, 1700s, this whole idea of enlightened. We are now enlightened. We, we now have this knowledge. And now that we are so knowledgeable, we are going to evolve into something uh, amazing and be able to evolve into a utopian society now that we have all this knowledge, all right? We're all a lot smarter than we were two, three hundred years ago. But are we any happier because we have all this amazing knowledge? So light you need is not something you need to know, but someone you need to know. It's really about that relationship with God. It's that someone. If you're feeling dark and you're feeling isolated and feeling anxious, Really what that is, 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 is God's kind of way of helping you to understand that, man, maybe I'm retreating from the God who made me. Maybe I'm retreating from other people. Maybe it's because they might, maybe rightly so in that regard, because they maybe hurt you or wounded you. But God loves you and wants you to step out of that darkness of isolation and into his glorious and wonderful light. But again, that light isn't so much of, of knowledge as it is his presence. 
his relationship. Jesus said it this way in John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, what? I give you the light? Is that what he said? What did he say there? He said, I am. It's highly relational there. Again, Jesus is always using relational language here. It's not about, hey, I, I am the guru to give you, dispense you a bunch of light because you guys are a bunch of idiots, and so you guys need me to tell you like it is. He says, no, I am the light. I am the light of the world, a world that is dark and perverse, that Paul would say. I am the light to come into the world to bring about wholeness to the isolated, to the broken, to the hurting, to the, to the disconnected. So he said, I am the light of the world. If you what? Follow me. Again, it's relational. If you come and you allow me and follow me through your life and do life with me, you won't have to walk in darkness. Because what is darkness? Darkness, again, is a disconnect with God and with other people. But primarily, it begins with a disconnect with God. If you follow me and you do life with me, you will find that your life will become, you know, uh, uh, more fulfilled. You will light up. He says, because you will have the light that leads to life. And again, who's the light? What's the light that leads to life? It's Jesus Christ himself. That everything that we find in our lives that brings us about the greatest amount of joy, when you read throughout all of Scripture, is really about a relationship with God. In the Old Testament, it talks a lot of times where God talks about to the Israelites, I'm going to give you a new heart, okay? I've already given you the law. I've already given you all the principles. I'm going to give you a new heart. What does he mean by giving you a new heart? He talks about giving a new heart because it's in the heart that we connect and relate to God. And so that's the idea that when Jesus Christ came into this world, it was God with us. That the light that we need in the darkness of our life is a relationship that we have with the God who created us. And then it's through that relationship with Jesus Christ that we begin, if we are willing to, to love each other as Christ has loved us, willing to be a safe space for other people to be authentic within our own lives so we can have the freedom and also be free to be authentic in other people's lives, then we will no longer live in darkness because a lot of darkness, again, is living in uh, shame, it's living in isolation, but God desires for us to live in the light in the community of each other and together. And so in 1 John 2, 7 says this, Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you, Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. And what's this old commandment? <laughs> it is to love one another. It is to love one another. How is this commandment an old and a new one? You know what he's basically saying here is this. It's old because this has been around forever. As long as God's been, which is eternal. eternal. Love has always been the guiding principle, has been the principle. So how in the world then is it a new one? You know why it's a new one? Because we forgot how to love well. We don't love well anymore. And how, what does it mean to love well? It's to love as Jesus has loved us, right? You know, a new command I give you, love one as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved you? He's loved you with all of his heart. He's loved you knowing the junk and the things that you're ashamed of, the things that you don't want to bring out into light. You know, he loves you even though he knows everything about you because he just loves you that much. And so he's telling us that we are to do the same thing. We are to love each other because all of us have junk. All of us have issues. All of us have shame. All of us have all of these things, you know. But when we live in a relationship to, with each other and love each other, guess what happens? We move out of the darkness and that stuff and into the light. So he says, love one another. And so in verse 8, he says, yet it, also, it is also new. Uh, Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. In other words, Jesus lived this commandment, right? And you also are living it. In other words, Jesus is saying, man, you know what? I know that you guys are loving each other. Jesus loved you. And now you're responding that love and how that you're loving each other and open, authentic relationships, not fake or plastered or gilded or Instagram relationships. You guys are living the real and the raw in your life. And guess what's happening when you guys are living the real and the raw? raw. The darkness in your lives are, is disappearing. 
That's how darkness disappears. When we live in gracious relationship with one another and we are able to live a life that's free and open, um, the darkness begins to disappear. It's one of the things that we have learned in our own life group. And we call it a life group, but we're not even, we're not even really a life group. We're more like family. We're a group that gets together. We're really a family that gets together every single um, week for the most part to encourage each other, to love each other, because we recognize that we need the light of an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, and we need the light of each other by which we do life together. And this past week, uh, some of the people in our group were just... Um, you know, texting back and forth, we use this thing called group me where we just kind of share life together. And um, we use it in order to encourage each other. Sometimes uh, some of us aren't doing so hot and we're down or stressed. And so we just put it on our, our group me in order to just express what's going on. And then people pipe in praying for one another. And guess what happens when, we, when we've done that? The darkness begins to go away in our lives. And we see that over and over and over. We are ruthless about the love for each other and being open and authentic. And so anyone, anyway, somebody shared this this week on our group me, and I, I wanted to share this with you. It says, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all for your love and support. You are all such a blessing to me. I have only been open with my depression with you all besides my family. Believe it or not, I'm typically a private person. But God has moved me to share with others because you never know who you can help or that others know they are not alone, which as we begin to realize in our own little family is we're not alone in our struggles. In fact, the more that we kind of begin to open up, we, we, we begin to kind of realize like, oh good, I'm not the only one, that's awesome. And we've learned that we're not alone in feeling alone. And so we tackle that by, by entering into those lonely places with each other and to put those light out there, which means sharing our lives and, and receiving and loving each other. And so in my journey, there has been a stigma attached to depression or any mental illness, so I have in the past remained quiet. Was that, you know what that means? That's code for darkness and isolation. Dealing with it alone, with the pain and the suffering, all by themselves. Why? Because they don't want people to think that they're, you know, uh, they have problems or issues and, and all that stigma. And so dealing with it. How many of us deal with that? Deal with the problems and stigmas of life all alone, but God never meant for us to do that. He meant for us to step out in the light, with his, which is an authentic relationship with him and with each other. And so my depression could be situational between October and December for no such reason. Where it's beautiful outside, uh, I can be all gray inside. Even though I may not understand, I am so incredibly grateful. Because through God and, and family and, and you guys, um, things, are beginning, things are changing in my life. And then somebody says this. Hey, you know, I have many of the same, this is somebody else coming back to this. I have many of the same struggles. Guess what? You're not alone. You thought you were alone, but you're not. I have, this, I have uh, many of the same struggles, and up until last year, I wouldn't dare talk about them due to the stigma and past experiences. But in being open with our, our group and others, I've seen how it has helped me to remove the shame from me, helped others struggling with similar situations and has helped change the course of my kids' lives and hopefully further generations too. I'm still very much a work in progress with lots of work to do, but just taking the steps to talk with others has been a huge step that I couldn't have occurred without you and the group's encouragement and ultimately God's goodness and grace. And then a new person to our little family um, is still just trying to get to know us a little bit more. It's going through some downtime as well. They've realized that, wait a minute, I feel alone, but then now I'm not the only one who feels this way. It says, loving these messages this morning, speaking of feeling down during this time, I myself is having one of those days today. So reading all you guys' messages makes me realize I'm not alone. I'm so thankful for each one of you. I'm so blessed by God. Guys, that's why Jesus came into this world. That is why he is the light he is the one that we need. And through the acceptance that we have of him and giving the acceptance of other people, guess what happens in our lives? The darkness goes away. Now, there's no doubt there are times when, you know, we allow darkness to seep back in. We get isolated. We start going dark. 
And that's why it's so important for us to remind ourselves that we need to come to the throne of grace. We need to come out of that darkness back into God's goodness and grace and reconnect into that relationship with him. But not only that, but to to come and reconnect with relationships with other people. Because I've noticed in my life when I'm connected in that way, the darkness doesn't last very long. And even when the darkness comes in my life and it hammers me, man, being around some other people to help me to kind of navigate some of that stuff, that darkness doesn't have to last very long in my life. That is the genius of how God works. For so many years, you know, I thought I had to learn all of these things. I spent five years in seminary, guys, 120 hours in master level theology, because I thought I had to know all of that stuff in order to to live this life rightly, in order to help you guys live this life rightly, until God began to really help me to understand this, that when people come to me for counseling, I really only try to do one thing, and it's this. Have you talked to God about it? man, I'm glad you're talking to me about it and I'll walk with you and and we'll do this thing together. But have you talked to God about it? Because I've realized over the years, for 20 years of ministry, that if I can give somebody just a shot to give God a shot and begin to build a relationship with him, it's amazing how God begins to work through that darkness in their lives. It's not very hard. God never meant it for us to be hard. We make it hard. It's just to come to him who is with us, and we do this together. We're going to sing a song here. It's an amazing song. I love this song. And what I want you to do is I want you to, wherever you're at, if you're dealing with a lot of depression, I want you to just begin to just, you know, some of the hardest things about when you're depressed is is to feel the strength to to take a step out of it. And my hope is that, that if you're feeling that this morning, that you would just give God a chance and you would just take one step and really listen to God as you either read these words or begin to sing these songs. And for all of us here, my hope is is that that you would take this moment, this few minutes or so, to, to really engage with God, not just to sing songs. There is no power at all in singing songs, even if it's a great tune and it has incredible message to it. There's no power in it if we're not connecting our hearts to God. And so as we worship this, as we sing this song, do nothing more than allow this to be the opportunity to connect with your God. Let's pray. Father, all of us in here have dealt with darkness in our lives, feeling isolated from you, feeling isolated from other people, Some of it can be just small little things like feeling ashamed of the dumb things that we've done in our lives that maybe even still nag us and hurt us that we still carry with us because we we just haven't really laid it at your feet or we haven't really been around other people that we feel safe enough to be able to step into that relational light to deal with that thing, God. So Father, I pray that you would be the prime mover and step into our darkness. And through that, not just, you know, giving us some kind of words of wisdom to try to get rid of something, but you would really step into our hearts as the living God, that your spirit would speak to our spirit, that you are our father, our our dad, and that you love us immensely. And so, Father, as we sing this song, we're going to sing it to you. Uh, For for me and for some of us, we're going to sing it off tune. But I pray that my heart is in tune with yours. Love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.